If Alejandro's Dune could have been made, it would have been bigger than 2001. It was built up to be the greatest achievement in science fiction, and it just evaporated into a billion small black pieces of space. Jurodowski's Dune, mm. all the elements that go into it, from the idea to the storyboard, the concept art, the casting, speaking to the studios to get it made, all of that hard work that goes into it by someone, Jurodowski, who just had a spark of genius, a spark of madness to get this made, and unfortunately failed Declan, as we see in the documentary. As soon as I saw Jurodowski being interviewed, I liked him. I liked him a lot. He seems like such a madcap guy. From the first interview, where he comes in and says Declan the way that I saw this being made when I was given the book and I read it I knew nothing about you I just saw making the film as from the audience point of view watching the film as you're on a giant LSD trip without the LSD and I thought I like this guy <laughs> mm. straight up what do you think of it? so personality wise I, I was digging him straight away you know you get people that want to be the wacky eccentric in life you can't pinpoint on exactly what it is but there's some intangible where you just like this is bullshit it's annoying because it's not authentic immediately you get that feel that he is genuinely an eccentric and like someone says later on they were based on seeing his movies they were expecting this long-haired wacky guy with a beard to come out and be crazy and what he got was this very dapper sophisticated slick well-groomed socialite intellectual type character he feels very authentic and he feels very fun. When I was watching like the clips of his old movies, because admittedly I'd never heard of this guy before, really want to go check out his other films now based on the little bits you see of him, but just when it's just based on him, like there's some people where the personality is more of the selling point than the art. We're not fans of poetry, but we both really love Charles Bukowski after seeing a really great documentary on him from back in the day. But even then it's like, it's not really the poetry, it's more him. And that's what I was getting off this guy. Like I really want to go see his back catalogue films just based off seeing him talk about how passionate he is and seeing what a whack job he is and hearing other people talk about but him as a character you can see straight away his superpower probably wasn't his creativity i think it was more his ability to sell the nonsense he was peddling he's very much a david lynchian art house filmmaker there's a lot of odd shit happening you know one guy comments at one point when he was being auditioned to be a part of the crew he watched one of his films. It was just nonsense. At one point, someone shit a golden <laughs> shit into a toilet and everyone was looking at it and he was just like, what is this? But I like it for some reason. But it was not so much what he was coming up with, but nearly his personality and enthusiasm. He was like a big Labrador running around, chewing on a toy when he would talk about ideas that he wanted to do. I wanted to work on this film, seeing him talk mm. about it and get excited about it. He just gets you excited. I need to find the warriors. Eh? the warriors to do it. Every person who will work in this picture will be a, spirit, a spiritual warrior. Let's screw on our studio executive heads. If he went up to the studio and they had looked at his previous body of work, I mean, the one that really caught my eye, he had Holy Mountain, all semi-naked people dancing on top of a fucking pyramid structure. Mm. Clearly this guy was on a bunch of psychedelics, wasn't he? You can tell from, oh, yeah. from, from, from it. But very surreal, it's very beautiful shots, very colourful, vivid shots. Like I can imagine being on shrooms and being like, whoa, mm. like, do you know what I mean? And I was invested in that. You know, the like El Topper Western he done, we're huge fans of Western Sir Declan like, I really want to check this out mm. I am going to check it out but if he went to a studio and was like look I want to make Frank Herbert's sprawling sci-fi epic June and they compared his body of work like I would be like are you sure you're the right guy to be doing this at the end of the day Declan the studio are corporate businesses they only want to make films which is going to churn a profit so you can see their reservation I get what you mean as well because when I was hearing him talk about his films the documentary was going through his previous films and showing clips of his previous films. And I was kind of like, this doesn't strike me as giant big sci-fi opera type dude, you know what I mean? But he starts to get into his vision of it and what he wants it to be. And he talks about A Touch of Evil by Orson Welles. Have you seen that, by the way? Yes. Fucking great Immense film. film. 
and one of the greatest opening shots of all time. That long tracking dolly crane shot that ebbs and flows through traffic at different periods. And he talks about where he wanted to replicate that in a way, but make something that would dwarf it in scale. And it was going to travel through space and the entire galaxy and past solar systems, past pirate ships attacking other ships to steal their spice dust, yeah. which is obviously integral to the plot of Dune past other battles going on in space and past and going back and revealing the whole tiny slice of the universe that the story is taking place in. And as he was saying it, I was just like, holy fuck, I wanted to see this. Yeah. And what's interesting, if you said that now, I'd be like, that sounds cool, but you're obviously going to use a lot of CGI to do that. And CGI is well and good. It'd nearly look too perfect, but clearly not quite real. Do you know what I mean? That uncanny valley that CGI has. But I was thinking... I so badly want to see the 1970s special effects version of that sequence. How would they have done it and what the fuck would that have looked like? In prep for this, I did go back and watch the most recent June one. You know, everyone had rave reviews about it. I sadly didn't watch it in the cinema, actually. I, I watched it in Stella the other day and I was gutted that I didn't get to see that mm. in the cinema. Sometimes I watch films that I feel really gutted I didn't get a mm. chance to see in the cinema. And you know when you like, you say to yourself, oh, I'm too busy, I don't have time to go to cinema. And then you watch it at home mm. and you're like, this is good. I think ratio but... of enjoying a film in the cinema to not enjoying it anyway near as much at home the highest ratio ever film for me is the revenant verging on not even that good of a film experience watching at home in the cinema one experience every director that has picked up the book straight away the first thing they go to is the visuals and and that's what he picks up on straight away we see the whole creative process starting to unravel I, I just found this intriguing as a film fan you know just from having that idea to actually get in the practical elements to make in the film mm. was fantastic for me to watch and the thing that you'd probably pick up first for this film is you have to get the visuals bang on in June and how he goes about doing that is he had a comic book laying about and he picks up this comic famous french comic book artist what i loved about this documentary everyone they talk about it goes in depth to their work mm. and it really gives you like an illustration of how they've got to where they were and why he chose them flashing up some of this morbius's work i, I wrote in my notes the storyboards that he had done and, the, and his mm. drawings were fucking incredible and this is such a fun part of the film because it really is it feels like an adventure film mm. it feels like that part of the film where the spy gets thrown out of the agency so he has to send his old crew and he gets his A-team together yeah, yeah. and you know the A-team music's playing he sees Dark Star by John Carpenter and he's like who did the special effects for this picks himself up Dan O'Bannon brings him over he gives him seemingly LSD laced weed to smoke yeah. and he starts freaking the fuck out Dan O'Bannon talks about these visuals exploding out of Juradowski's face but that somehow perfectly conveying exactly what he wanted for the film this is special marijuana I said oh boy all I remember is I was getting incredibly relaxed and that I was looking straight into his eyes. When all of a sudden, at the conclusion of a sentence, he said, like this, and wham, out from his face, shot these radiating lines of patterns which proceeded to produce around his head a circular shimmering mandala or kaleidoscope like pattern with his face in the center and his eyes fixed on mine and the rest of the room vanishing into oblivion and then his whole he relaxed all of his features the eyes which have been staring into mine like something supernatural all of a sudden relaxed down the head lids came down and the face smiled and it changed back the 20 years came back onto his face and the hallucinative visual effect and the mental effect dispersed immediately just bink. And I was completely dazzled. I was dazed at the experience. He said, all right, I want you to do the special effects. And I said, all right. I said, well, hell yes. They have a meeting with Pink Floyd to do the music. Not the music for the film, the music for one part of the film. And this is interesting as well because Pink Floyd didn't even want to give their music to Kubrick. To be fair, Kubrick for 2001 A Space Odyssey wanted to take some of their existing music but edit it a bit. And that's what they were against. I don't believe he actually requested them for an original score. And by the way Jurodowski talks about it, 
doesn't sound like they were that into the idea of doing his film either. When they first met him, you know, that he's, he says they were sitting around and he was trying to, like we said, sell him on the film mm. in his enthusiastic way. And they were just sitting around eating burgers and kind of just, he just had this feeling where he wasn't taking it seriously and it wasn't Gamma. And he fucking lost it and started shouting at him. This is going to be the most important thing for the world, making this film. Because that's what he says throughout this. He, he keeps banging on this idea that this is not just going to be a big film. It's going to be like an important film. Which sounds so up your own ass and grandiose and delusional, but you actually buy into it when he's describing the scale and the absurdity of that this film was going to be. I was buying into it. I was like, yeah, this really, it really does feel like the world missed out on something. And after Scream that Pink Floyd, it completely changed the tone of the meeting and they came completely on board for it. But that was just the music for one of the civilizations. Every civilization in this who are at war and doing their house of cards shenanigans, every single one of them was going to have their own unique musical score scored by someone entirely different you know and this is why i love jared Dallas. the level of his ambition is unmatched you know he said right at the start of the film this june film would be the second coming of god <laughs> and that and that just sums up how how brilliant he was the film never was made but you can't have a masterpiece without madness and then he even went on to be so brash Declan to say if this film was made it would be bigger than 2001 A Space Odyssey I can he see believed that. it he I can, believed I, it I can really see that like I buy into the absurd over the top vision and it nearly feels like the cauldron it was being made in was ripe just to produce something truly special if the story of making it is this wonderful yeah. and absurd then what would have actually come out would have just been fucking unbelievable and most of the people by the way hadn't worked in film before obviously Dan O'Bannon was you know the comic book artist was like I'm not a film guy mm. why are you bringing me in you know he wanted a really gothic sort of art escape design for their world and their civilization and their designs it's underrated idea to actually bring in these distinct different creative forces to create different parts of a universe you know that's proper world building from a visual and aesthetic and design thing from the ground up having a completely different creative mind tackle these completely different civilizations and then the fact that you know there are people from America people from England people here people from there but they all have to sell all their stuff and move to paris to work on this crazy film project where like you said there was this enormous bible some people referred to it as a giant book that looked about you know Daddy, pick it up. a2 size yeah. thousands upon thousands of pages thick filled with designs and storyboards and the entire film that apparently worked out at a 14 hour running time so you'd have to assume it was going to be cut up into several films obviously the studio were like what the fuck like you can't make a 14 hour film part of the reason why it sadly never got made they wanted it one and a half hours how much do you want to they wanted it one and a half yeah, hours that's one of the reasons why that's just stupid yeah, yeah. because but how sorry how much would you love to get a hold of that bible and look through it Seeing the book, looking at the images, and hearing Yudorovsky telling me what was going to happen in every scene. So, in a way, I'm the only guy who actually ever saw Yudorovsky's tune. I am the only spectator that has seen the movie. And I'm going to tell you something. It's awesome. When I was in Milan, I went into like this really posh aftershave perfume shop yeah. and they had like a table book. They called it table book. It was the size of the table, mm. literally. I could not pick it up. And it was behind the scenes of the Rolling Stones in black and white, oh, yeah. which was pretty cool. But this Bible dwarfed that. And apparently there's only two copies of that. He has one himself. He's often flicking for it in the film. And then someone else has it, but there's only two in existence. Mm. It's not in print. I'd, I'd love to buy that and just look at it. One person outside of him talks about it where he's one of the few people in history that could read it and look at it through. And he feels like he's actually seen the movie. Mm. And he said... This would have been the greatest film of all time. What really struck me about this early on in the documentary, to, to create a good film, to I guess mm. to create even a bad film, in essence, you need an incredible amount of good luck. He was saying when he wanted Morbius, he didn't know Morbius. Mm. He just had his comic book. And he was like, I want this random French bloke, but I've never met him. And this is before the age of the internet, where you could just go on the internet, find out a person. He was like, how the fuck am I going to find this guy? And then when he went to meet his agent, he thought, in and I was like, I need this Morbius guy with a comic book in his hand. And by a, a stroke of luck, pure coincidence, 
Morbius was just in the building in the next room <laughs> and he was like fuck like how has this happened all the omens were there mm. you need that fucking great good luck we've all heard about films and productions Declan that have had terrible luck but to make something this grandiose this something epic you do need good luck and I, that really struck me and with all the luck that was going its way you nearly feel like it was the universe aligning the planets to make sure this film happens, which is again makes it so sad that it never ended up happening. But you see this luck happen again where he had decided another one of the civilizations, he wanted their musical theme to be written and created by the Rolling Stones. He wanted him to do the music, the Rolling Stones, but he also wanted to cast Mick Jagger. At a, what was he at? Is that like, was that a, like a soiree? A, like party a party or yeah. a function or a festival or something in this room of sort of famous people and rich people and whatever. Mick Jagger was on the other side of the room and he saw him cross the room to meet him. Him, dodged and walked past all these other different famous people that wanted to get Mick Jagger's attention and went straight up to start talking to him. I guess because he heard that he wanted to do his film. Or maybe he hadn't even, but he asked him, like said, I'm making a film. And he just was like, apparently, yes on the spot. Didn't even need to be sold by it or know anything about it. The casting that he wanted was just fucking mad as well. Like it, it ties into every other element of the film. The casting choices he wanted to choose was crazy. Salvador Dali, he went to meet mm. Dali twice. And Dali, being the fucking nutcase, whack job he is, made it into a game. Literally would meet him in a restaurant, ask him riddles. Why does the rose have so many fawns? And he'd just say, well, you need three fawns because four would be too much. Or some gibberish yeah. mumbo jumbo. And then Salvador Dali would be like, yes, meet me in Barcelona. <laughs> and then Al flows. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And like, I don't... What do you reckon that was? Was that him just being weird and trying to fuck with him? Or was that a dog meeting a new dog? Jumping here, jumping there, sort of going for him in that way of finding out. Will you play with me? Will you play along? I think all of the above. Like, literally, like, you know, Starley's demands just got more and more worse <laughs> yeah. as it went on. Like, suddenly he wanted to be the highest paid actor ever. Because I assume, I'm sure he was in some sort of art house films before this. Yeah, he was. You know, his main vocation in life clearly wasn't acting. But he just decided, I want to be the highest paid actor of all time. Yeah, for, for, for essentially Declan, you know, as Jura Dowsey said, he, he didn't even even have that big of a role in a film the 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 screen time he would have got was very significant role it's a significant the screen role. time the screen right. time was short it was a significant role sorry Declan it amounted to something like three minutes so he was like <laughs> I want a hundred thousand dollars per minute, which would have made him the highest paid actor for the minutes yeah. on the screen. So they went to all these compromises. Yeah, that was their ingenious compromise because originally he he said I want hundred thousand an hour, yeah. as in an hour on set, which is obviously completely absurd. But they went and rewrote everything and came up with a perfect plot device to logically have a reason for him to barely have any screen time where because the emperor in the story was so paranoid he had a replica robot there to mimic it i said i will take a moulage of you hyper realistic and i will make the emperor of the galaxy he's so afraid to be killed he have a robot and the robot will act yeah. So most of his scenes would actually be filmed with a robot version of Salvador Dali playing his decoy version of the Emperor in the film. What a fucking great idea. What kind of insane guy hears that kind of demands for Salvador Dali and thinks, okay, we can work with this. Like, let's think of a way around this where we can make it work. And it's nearly brilliant. Like, that's such a cool idea that there would have been a robot Salvador Dali on set saying his lines in a weird robot voice as part of the film. But what, what again, like, I have great admiration for drawing Dalsky all throughout this film and it grew more and more I liked him from the first like second but it's like he goes to these meetings and this fucking weirdos like messing about acting like the Riddler Batman saying mm. all the shit I'd leave that deck and be like oh no I can't be fucking bothered with that that's just fucking annoying he knew how difficult this was going to be to do and he persevered with it and that's why I love mm. him do you know what I mean and he also people like that sometimes you can be with him five minutes and be like oh my god this is exhausting yes. he didn't give me that vibe at all and everyone around him who spoke so glowingly about him didn't give me the vibe that he was like that at all he felt like the kind of guy where he would transmit his energy to you rather than yes. suck you of your energy just because they're exhausting and intense and they don't shut the fuck up there's something about him where his energy and enthusiasm 
enthusiasm was just contagious. And again, it's because it, I felt like he was a genuine character. He wasn't trying to emulate a character or be a character. This is very much his project, his vision. And at no point did I get that he was controlling in any way. He would mm. go and see the storyboard artists and like whatever they had done, like he wouldn't be one of those directors be like, no, this is not what I wanted. Go back to the drawing board, literally. He would look at it and go, wow, this is fantastic. And give him like whole creative processes. The American guy, not the German Gothic guy, was mm. a bit weird actually. <laughs> he he Very sounded nasty, like he like... smoked all the cigarettes. Yeah, in Germany. yeah. But um, the American guy was like, I was very green on films. This was my first film, and I was scared. I was nervous. I'm sure he was a busy guy. He was like the main director. He was trying to deal with all these top actors and top castings, and he would make a point to come and see me and have a coffee and look at my drawings and say, "This is great. This is fantastic." And you know, give me a hug and you're doing such great work and mm. I, I love that like yeah it just sounded them. like a wonderful rare experience and I feel like that is also why people wanted to be a part of it because it felt like something rare there's something so fun about the idea of essentially what was an independent filmmaker like he w obviously was making films with budgets before that but he was not a Hollywood guy obviously making this giant big budget sci-fi epic assembling all these people who either had no background in filmmaking at all or even when they did you know Dan O'Bannon was a garage special effects genius you know Dark Star which has incredible special effects even now was literally made for like I think 50,000 or something absurd him and John mm. Carpenter mm. Like, in some ways, that's John Carpenter's greatest accomplishment. Like, even he, who's one of the few people he assembles with a film background, is not your typical Hollywood film guy. And you're assembling all these people, you're casting Mick Jagger, Salvador Dali, and assembling all these artists and comic book artists, and all these people who had never had any history in filmmaking, getting together all these unconventional musical people who had never actually scored for film to score the music. And it just sounds fucking fun even if it would have been a lot of absurdity and bullshit fuck me it would have been fascinating and unique back to the casting he wanted someone for the role of the big fat yeah basically <laughs> the like fatty. the storyboards like you know i haven't read june i have it on my shelf actually my dad gave it to me yeah. i'm gonna read that i haven't um, read it either and i'm just bad with names like it's but you know who we're talking the big floating fat it's basically a big floating fat geezer who did he know that was like really fat and grossly fat and obese no other than his favourite film director, Orson Welles himself. So he mm. wanted to cast him, which I thought was genius. He was like, I, well, I've based a lot of my inspiration off Orson Welles, so why not cast him? And I love this story <laughs> where he goes into this famous French restaurant where Orson Welles loves to eat. And by this point, Orson Welles is, you know, you've all seen that outtakes of when he's trying to film that wine commercial when he's really old and he's all hammered on set and slurring his mm. words and eating in between takes. And that is him in this era where he's just big and fat and he's like I like food I like booze and that's what I'm gonna fucking shove down my pipe every second of the day he doesn't give a fuck doesn't want to act anymore doesn't care and he goes into the restaurant you know he asks like what's the best bottle of wine sends it over to him calls him over and wants to talk to him and he's selling him on the film but he's just like I just don't want to do it like I don't want to make a film I don't want to do this he knows that like he pretty much comes into this restaurant every single day so he says to him I will offer this chef of this restaurant more money than he gets here so much money that he can't refuse it so that he'll come and be your own personal chef on set every day and he's like fuck it let's do it <laughs> see see like again admiration level rising like you've got to work with what they want to get mm. what you want do you know what i mean so he fought on his feet like what does this fat bastard like food <laughs> do you know what i mean like it's clever like it's very clever oh, the way absolutely. he manipulates it and then other casting we've got kill bill david carradine yeah who was very very big on tv in a very famous tv show at the time and he kind of had the look and the kind of athletics to play this part. Another funny story as well, when uh, <laughs> Jorodowski said he had bought like a big, big tub of vitamin D pills or vitamin yeah, E pills what was that? for like $60 and David Carradine just bowls in and was like, oh, these vitamin D and just proceeds to pick up the Swallow whole the tub. whole thing at once. Fucking hell. Like, so another great casting call as well. But, you know, this might have been possibly one of the greatest casts ever assembled. Well, most of fantastically absurd casts yes. as well because like the beauty of this film is usually like it's rare for a film to have one member of the cast who's not really a film person or an unusual bit of casting but it works 
perfectly. I'll give you an example. The Prestige. David Bowie playing Nikola Tesla. David Bowie's acted before, but he's not an actor. He's a guy who's acted in a couple of films mm. every now and then. But is that not the perfect casting? The perfect cast. That wasn't like something you auditioned him for. At one point, it came to Christopher Nolan. I wonder if yeah. David Bowie would do it. Maybe that was just who he was picturing in his mind as Nikola Tesla as he was writing it. And to get him to actually do it. And he's perfect. There's no real tangible reason why David Bowie, as who he is in his life and what he's done, is perfect to play Nikola Tesla. You know, he's not from the same country. He didn't. He's not involved in science. He's not this. But it's something about David Bowie's wackiness and creativity mm. in real life mm. and mannerisms and behavior perfectly translate to what you imagine Nikola Tesla is like. And I think it's just that aura of genius. Like Nikola Tesla was a genius. David Bowie, I don't care what anyone says, was a genius. And he wasn't a bad actor as well, David Bowie, you know. Yeah. He, was in, he was in stage as the elephant man, wasn't he? He was in that Man Who Fell to Earth, which was I perfect think casting. He was really, really yeah. good. Yeah. But he just didn't act. Bits of like inspired casting like that is so rare and so exciting when it gets it right. And this film feels like... You know, obviously you'd have to see it and see if it actually worked, but you'd have to believe it was going to work. And whatever would have come out, it would have been just amazing. Like, it would have been amazing. Yeah. And I don't think when you're auditioning, you don't think, who's a guy that's acted twice and is actually a music? You know what? You just don't think of that. And that's why the choices of this film were so exciting. So the special effects, he wanted to get the guy that had done 2001, didn't he? This on paper, to get the guy that done 2001, which at the time was incredible, by the way. Best special effects the world had ever seen. Best special what's different from Juradowski's other choices his other choices he's gone for the absurd element but this on paper just made the most sense yeah. like it's, it's sensible he's done that space epic before mm. would have easily translated but unfortunately when he went to interview him this guy just seemed like a terrible gun <laughs> like he just seemed like a dickhead and I guess it would get to your head, Declan, if everyone's going to you, you're the best special effects artist alive. Mm. It, which was probably true, Declan. I guess it would inflate your ego. And he was like, nope, nope, nope. I'm doing it this way and that way. So the, the, the friction and the creative differences, as he said, he called like the people he was assembling. My warriors. My warriors. <laughs> and he was like, this guy was not my warrior. He wasn't willing to buy into the vision. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, look, it's your talent and your expertise so you can exercise it how you wish and it's what you want to do. But it is a shame because ultimately you are the technician. As creative a process as it is, you are ultimately the technician. So you've got to get on board with the vision of the director. But again, how much would he have fit in with the rest of the film? And also the person he ended up going with was fucking Dan O'Bannon. Dan O'Bannon mm. who went on to do Alien. Dan O'Bannon who, you know, did so many great special effects throughout his career you know he found a genius young so really it just showed again that this guy he should have been a talent scout because he yeah. was amazing at finding all these unique individual people who weren't even in the industry he is a bright of filmmaking <laughs> it's like oh there's another Colombian genius here but all of it's come together now Declan and they're looking for a 15 million dollar budget which I don't know maybe at the time that would have been a it lot huge. Yeah, it was huge yeah huge. but like thinking like talking about it now and looking at what he wanted I'm like no like no, you could have done it you know 2001 million. wasn't was mm, probably a bit, mm. bit less than that and um, maybe a little bit more they've nearly got a 15 million together and they literally uh, and this bit just made me sad because I knew it didn't get made but mm. like obviously watching this documentary I was like oh, this could have been made and like I knew at some point it's gonna just collapse and like, I felt sad Do you know what I mean because I really wanted it it happen. makes you grieve for a film you never knew should have yeah. existed yeah and it's like they need the last two million essentially you know they're going to all the studios I think in the end Disney is like their last resort they, they go to Disney just give us the last couple of million and we'll get this off the ground the big failing point Declan is this immense vision this immense film would have been 14 hours on paper Disney turned around and said 14 hours they asked it to me to make a picture one one hour and a half and a half for the theaters and I said no the, why the time I will make I will make a picture of 12 hours or 20 hours 
the time that they were making films, an hour and a half was long enough. Do you mm. know what I mean? And they were, they were just flat out. This is great, but unless you can get the running time down to a running time that audiences will actually go to the cinema and see, this is pointless. Mm. So therefore they refuse the funding. And this is one thing where I felt like Jurodowski, not out of character, but all the way through it, he tried to do these absurd things and he would find a compromise when he had to. Mm. And it would be a compromise that wouldn't actually compromise his vision or the film, but it would be a compromise it'd be an ingenious compromise yeah. the robot decoy character for the emperor that would mean he could still make Dali the highest paid actor of all time technically per minute on screen hiring the chef from the French restaurant to be his own personal chef on set convince Orson Welles you know he found all these compromises yeah. and maybe he did occur to him but you feel like couldn't you be like well we'll make this into a trilogy of films yes. you'll make even more money mm-hmm. but then again that is a very modern concept of having preconceived trilogy or franchises it was back in the day it was a case of you'd make one film and if it was a big hit you'd be like even if it wasn't the kind of film that should have a sequel you'd make five Five sequels if they kept making money you'd find a way to do it there wasn't this preordained this film is going to be a two-part or this film is going to be a trilogy or it's going to be seven films or whatever the fuck mm. so once again he was too far ahead of his time if even if he did come up with a concept but it's just such a shame you just felt like with all the hurdles he magnificently navigated and worked through and you know the problems weren't even problems they were just opportunities to make it an even more exciting fun wacky film and he just couldn't get over that last hurdle no with a devil in our, in our pocket, this, this incredible money, I in the pocket, this money, this, this, this shit, this nothing, this paper who have nothing inside. Movies have heart, boom, 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 have mind, have power. Have ambition. I wanted to do something like that. Why not? It was sad. It was really sad, actually. I'm gutted about it. Mm. <laughs> if, if after seeing that and after seeing what it could have been, it's like he was going to cast his son as Paul because his son had been in like El Topa, Western character. Mm. I thought, who better to be central character than my own flesh and blood? Why can't I pass this on to my family? That's a bit of heritage, which I loved as well, by the way. His son Paul was saying, even though this didn't get made, it still has such weight and such relevance in the film industry. And then we see a beautiful like, end sequence of shots of films mm. that have been made and it's obviously inspired by the work that went on the film. Like you see Alien Covenant and you'd see some of the sets mm. the gothic German designer had made with the skulls and you see the exact thing in Alien Covenant mm. as the ships flying over. And the crew he'd assembled that then went on to continue to work in the film yeah. industry even though they'd never had experience in the film. And technically still hadn't if you count the fact that they didn't actually make a film. Many of the team went on to make Alien. And you see so much of the design and some of the ideas and the aesthetic in Alien and others in Terminator and other things and just and you know Blade Runner and on and on and on despite never actually seeding into a tree roots still grew and like go back and forth and and like it does have an everlasting effect on the shape of film and cinema you know he was saying they took my warriors and my warriors went on to like some of them went on to the heights of filmmaking winning Oscars for their work they took my warriors and I was sad about it but I was so happy to see them do well and it just made me think like what a guy like do you know what i mean like and they did go on to make june by the way not exactly in his vision not at all in his vision not at all in his vision sorry they hired david lynch and he was saying out of all the directors they could have hired i think he's the one that can make it good his son was saying ah oh, let's just go and see it and he was flat out refusing i refuse to see it i don't want to see it because it's not mine what i wanted he was hurt by that and also hurt by the fact that oh david lynch might make a better yeah film. he might, might make it better and then he said he went to see it and he was like it's just shit <laughs> Which is, so he was like terrible. he was just laughing like do you know what i mean so you know and then it ends with him like it ends with juridowski himself you know i'm sad i couldn't I, I couldn't make it but the whole ride was great and you know i'm glad that it, its relevance has still got into other areas of films mm. and you know his warriors have gone on so you know although it didn't come to fruition it, it, it still had an impact and you know i really really i just thoroughly enjoyed this documentary and in a way as much as we might have missed out 
out on such a wonderful film. The fact that it seeds an impact ended up giving us maybe hundreds of wonderful films as a result. You know, that's a better trade off if it was the trade to be made. And there's just no doubt in that this was one of the greatest films never made. For anyone that's a big film fan, for anyone that's a, a fan of like the whole filmmaking process and the work that goes into it, this was a fantastic insight into how it works. And the amount of work that has to go into it, Declan, before it even starts shooting, was just flabbergasting, like the casting, everything. So if you're a fan of film, it's a, it's a must-watch documentary. You want to make the most fantastic art of movie? Try. If you fail. It's not important. No? We need to try.